Okay, let's see. I need to represent the concept of an odd duck. Well, that's a duck. Uh, yeah, there we go. Duck with a top hat. That's pretty odd. But it's missing something. There it is. Now that's an odd duck. My mom always said I'm a bit of an odd duck. Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. So you've built things and you want them to fit together, right? Do you know what a clearance fit is? You know what a press fit is? What about a locational transition fit? What does all this mean? Let's talk about it right now. Fits between components really start to matter once you've progressed in your machining education to the point where you want to start building mechanisms. Now you need multiple parts to fit together to a certain level of quality. And if you've been working in CAD and you've designed some fancy assembly that you're very proud of, you've got all these dimensions in there, these numbers are what we call the nominal dimensions, and in machining, nominal is a synonym for fictional, because you're never going to hit any of them. So the question is, how close can we get, and in what direction, and how much does it matter? I guess that was three questions. Look, I'm not a mathologist, okay? So here's how I like to think about it. This is what I call the hill of precision. And we're all climbing this hill, especially when we're first learning. The bottom axis there is the tolerance of a dimension that you can hold on a particular part. You can see that as we go down in tolerance, we get finer and finer tolerances. The skill required to hit those tolerances goes up pretty exponentially. So the units on the left might be something like sprocket to robin. Now, of course, equipment matters also, so let me overlay some rectangles here to illustrate that. Shown in yellow there is kind of like hobbyist grade equipment, and then in purple would be like high-end professional industrial tool room equipment, that sort of thing. And then the overlap area, that gray-green area, is kind of where if you have enough skill, you can make low-budget equipment do those things, but if you have high-end equipment, you don't need as much skill to get the equipment to hit those tolerances. So the point of that is, to some degree, you can buy your way out of having skill. This is true in many things in life. By way of example, if you've ever gone to a track day with the desire to drive your car fast in a safe and controlled environment, then you're probably familiar with the tech bro who shows up in his purple Gallardo expecting to dominate the field of amateurs, and then one of the instructors happens to be Craig Stanton who dusts the floor with him in his rented Kia. So the point is that while the money you spend on your equipment does matter, it matters a lot less than people like to think it does, and skill is in fact a much more dominant variable. So here in the machine shop, you can get budget equipment to do a lot if you have skill. And there's an argument to be made that it's better to get good on worse equipment so that when you do get good equipment, you will be much more successful with it right out of the box because you've seen all of the weaknesses of rigidity and you know bearing quality and so on that you get with lower end equipment. The higher end equipment isn't covering up your mistakes as it were. Now this has limits of course, you're never going to hold sub tenth dimensions consistently on a 7x14 mini lathe, but the range of what your equipment can do is probably larger than you think it is. You can also think of this hill of precision in terms of processes. So starting on the left, you've got things like band sawing, and then as we move into the middle, you get into machining, and then as we move off to the right, you get into surface grinding and lapping and even scraping and other processes up there. Now some of those processes like scraping and, and surface grinding tend to be more about flatness and squareness rather than dimensional tolerance, but you know, I'm muddling up some terms here, but it's just to give you an idea that as you're climbing the hill of precision, you're also shifting processes as you go. Not only that, as you're shifting processes, you're also incurring extra time. So this hill of precision is very much about climbing an exponential hill of time. Think about that in your designs. You know, don't specify a tenth's tolerance if it doesn't really need it for that part, because it's going to cost you exponentially more time to hit a tenth tolerance than it is to hit a two or a five thou tolerance. And that's partly because you're switching equipment, you know, you're going from the bandsaw and then having to set up a machine tool and then having to set up the surface grinder. But it's also about operations within that tool, as we'll see here in a moment. If you're trying to hit a, a finer tolerance on the mill with a hole, you might have to set up a spotting drill and then you have to set up a reamer and it's extra operations with each part part as well. So all of that adds up very, very quickly, especially on multiple features on a given part. So always remember when designing your parts that precision is very, very expensive. And this can be a little bit disappointing for beginning machinists because a lot of us get into this with that desire to make everything perfect. But if you go for that absolutely perfect dimension every time on every part, honestly, you're never going to finish anything. Are you crying? There's no crying in machining. So you have to kind of learn when to dial it back and learn to be comfortable with just a tolerance that would make a woodworker cry. 
Another way to think about this hill of precision is to flip it around and look at trying to hit a specific dimension. Let's say you're trying to hit exactly one inch. Any specific dimension is always asymptotic in the real world. You can get closer and closer and closer to that exact number with more and more expensive and time consuming processes, but you'll never ever get exactly to it. So all the way on the left there, again, you've got your bandsaw, which can trivially hit anywhere between 0.9 and 1.1 inches, and it's very, very fast. And then in the middle there, you've got your beginning machinist who can hit plus or minus a thou on that dimension without too much trouble. But then as you get further and further to the right and you get into those surface grinding and lapping and other exotic processes, you get ever closer to that exact one inch, but you'll never ever get there. That is until you go over. And as we all know, machining is subtractive manufacturing, which means price is right rules. Whoever gets closest without going over wins. Okay, so we need some kind of common nomenclature to discuss how well two parts fit together. We typically do this by speaking in terms of a shaft and a hole. We've got a theoretical perfect shaft and a theoretical perfect hole, and we want to know what size do those two things need to be in order to fit together certain ways. If you crack open the books, you'll find various different graphical representations of these types of standards. This is a typical one you'll find on the ANSI system, and they're showing how oversized the holes can be or how undersized the shafts can be and still meet a particular standard of fit. So you've got holes above zero and shafts below zero. Like any other system of measurement, this needs to be calibrated. So typically you'll see those charts calibrated to say a one inch diameter for ANSI. And then you'll find a chart like this in Machinery's handbook that shows you how to scale the tolerances up or down depending on the size of the part. Back to the aforementioned nomenclature. In the Imperial Machine Shop, you're most likely to encounter the ANSI system, which is a two letter code followed by a number. And the two letter code is an abbreviation that makes decreasing amounts of sense as you go along. And the number indicates the closeness of the fit. Higher numbers are looser fits. Meanwhile, in the metric machine shop, you're more likely to encounter the ISO system, which is a pair of letter number codes. The capital letter representing the tolerance on the hole and the lowercase letter representing the tolerance on the shaft. And then once again, the numbers representing the closeness of the fit with larger numbers being looser fits. And there's actually two pairs for each fit. So these are the equivalents to an RC6 in the ANSI system. And and these are dependent on whether you're using a hole basis or a shaft basis. Basically, which of the two features are you holding constant and which one are you varying? The basis is the one that's remaining constant. Now there is a whole elaborate system underpinning these numbers and codes, but there's really only a small set of them that you're likely to encounter in standards, the so-called preferred values for these. And I'll do my best to explain the equivalence as we go along, but I will be describing the ANSI system in more detail. First is LC or locational clearance. That's very generally, hey, I want a hole to kind of land here because I got something that's gonna go through there. Next is RC or running clearance. And this is, hey, I've got these two pieces of a mechanism. They need to slide together precisely and not bind up. And then we have the force fits or interference fits, also known as press fits. And this is, hey, I've got these two pieces of a mechanism. And I wanna put them together and have them never come apart again. And I don't like glue or welding. There's one other odd duck here that I'll include here and we'll talk about it later and that's the LT or locational transition fit. This does have some use in the hobby shop as we'll talk about. And there are a few other categories here that I'm not including which are even more odd ducks, but those are not gonna be generally useful for hobbyists. Okay, let's make some chips. I'm gonna show you kind of the five main fits that the hobbyist really needs to know about and how to achieve those fits, where they're used and so on. And I'm gonna calibrate all of this to a quarter inch shaft because that's kind of a good typical size of part that you might be making in a hobby machine shop. Now we have two variables here, right? The hole and the shaft. And it's easier if we hold one of those variables constant and modify the other. So I made this measuring shaft, if you will, for this purpose. I don't have a gauge pin, which would be the proper way to do this, but uh, I turned this guy on my lathe with emery paper of varying grits to as close as I could get to perfectly on 250 thou all the way down. You can see that I've got uh, maybe 30 millionths of taper there, but we're very, very close to being dead nuts on 250. Metric sidebar. I'm gonna be talking in inches here, but on screen I'm gonna be showing the ISO metric equivalents of things, and those are gonna be calibrated to a six millimeter shaft, just so that we're very close to the same ballpark here in both systems. I'm gonna start with LC11. LC11 is great for large scale fabrication when you've got a lot of parts that may not be perfectly straight or that might be warped from weldings, and you wanna make sure that the bolt holes are all gonna line up. LC11 is your friend. 
this is the type of clearance that you would encounter when you're, you know, bolting together parts for a workbench or something like that. It can be easily achieved on a drill press with no effort at all, and it's also achievable with forming and extrusion processes. So if you buy round bar, it's typically going to be within LC11. And in fact, it's so easy to hit even on a drill press that I actually had to drill this hole a 64th oversize for this demonstration. Note that all of these holes are being deburred. That's really important, especially on the tighter fit classes where the burr can really mess you up. And here's our test pin in an LC11 hole. So you can see lots and lots of slop. Pin just falls right through, nothing to it. Once again, it's gonna be like a generous clearance hole on a bolt. Moving up that hill of precision to LC9 now. LC9 is like a little higher quality clearance fit for bolts and fasteners. So when you're bolting up machined assemblies, machined parts, and you want things to fit together a little bit nicer, you don't have to be as generous because you know the parts are all well made. LC9 is where it's at. So this is easily achieved with slightly more careful drilling than on the basic drill press, basic fabrication level. So we're on the mill now and we're drilling a little bit carefully. We've got a nice sharp drill and we're making sure that it doesn't wander too much. And that fit is like this. So the pin still drops in easily under its own weight. There's still plenty of noticeable wiggle there, but it's a higher quality fit. Now we're entering the precision zone, starting with RC6. This is a great fit for parts that need to move together freely and may be exposed to temperature. So for example, the piston in an internal combustion engine is gonna be typically an RC6 so that it can slide freely up and down, but it's still properly located. It's not gonna get crooked in the bore, but as it heats up, it's not gonna seize. RC6 is still easily achieved on the mill, but we do need to use a reamer for this. So basic drilling, 164th undersize, and then a decent quality reamer. On the shaft side, RC6 is still easily achievable with basic lathe turning as well. And that fit looks like this. So the pin still falls into the hole, but it falls slowly. We're just starting to experience the effects of air pressure there. So it's starting to make it hard for the air to escape as that pin falls. And there's just the tiniest, tiniest bit of perceptible wiggle in there. On now to RC3, and this is where you need parts that can still slide on one another, but there really needs to be zero play. And this is not a good choice for parts that might experience any kind of temperature change. A little bit of heat and an RC3 mechanism is going to seize up. But if you've got a slow moving mechanism that needs to be extremely precise, RC3 is where it's at. So now we need to get serious about some of our operations on the mill. We're into the high effort zone now on precision. So we're gonna start by spot drilling or center drilling to guarantee that that drill doesn't wander off and oversize the hole. For larger holes, you are also gonna to wanna to start pilot drilling at this point. And then we're gonna drill undersize and then we're gonna ream extremely carefully. And on the shaft side, this is still achievable with basic turning. You may have to do a little bit of polishing and you are gonna to start to notice tool deflection here. So if you're boring an RC3 hole, it's very easy to get enough taper from boring bar deflection to where it won't fit properly anymore. And here you can see we're really experiencing those air pressure effects now. The part doesn't wanna fall under its own weight. And as I push on it, there's a bit of an air spring effect. I can still push it in easily, but the air pressure underneath is definitely pushing back on me, and there's now no perceptible wiggle in that at all. And this is also where you start to get that characteristic pop when you pull the pin out. Now that's as low as we're gonna go on the running fits. It is possible to achieve RC2 in the hobby shop, but it's not easy and it's very difficult to do it consistently. I have occasionally gotten lucky doing it, but if you need that fit, you're better off at that point making the hole first and then turning the part to fit, probably using emery paper for the finishing because the level of precision that you need for an RC2 or better is much easier to achieve on the lathe than it is with any kind of hole making tool. Now, if you have a floating reamer holder combined with high quality reamers, those will pretty consistently hit RC2, but they can be a little spendy for the hobbyist. If you'd like to try your hand at making a floating rumor holder, I'm gonna to link to Nigel down below at the Go Create a Hobby Shop. He's got a great video series on making one for Emma Ritson's Spare Room Machine Shop tool making competition. It's a beautiful piece of work. Sidebar on piston fits, because I think this is of interest to a lot of hobbyists. I mentioned internal combustion engines typically being an RC6, and that's for the piston on the bore. That is not for the rings on the bore. The rings are much closer than that, because of course they have to be a gas tight seal. So typically for ringed piston setups, you're gonna have a little looser fit like an RC6 because that gives them the temperature range that they need to operate in. And then the rings can compress in the grooves as they expand and contract. 
Now, if you're making a ringless piston fit, you're gonna to wanna to be somewhere in the RC3, 4, or 5 range. And so a good thing to do typically is to aim for RC2, and then you're likely to miss it a little bit and you'll end up somewhere in the RC3, 4, 5 range. And that's gonna be a pretty good compromise between room for thermal expansion and sealing against gases. It's not gonna be perfect, but for, for example, steam engines where you don't need a perfect gas seal, then uh, that works out pretty good. Moving on to the interference fits now, the most basic of these that are going to be useful to the hobbyist is FN2. And this is just a basic press fit for when you want two things assembled permanently. This is very easy to achieve in the hobby shop. And the secret sauce for this is over under reamers. So I've got a 1000 undersize reamer here, and I'm also exercising the same level of precision that you would with an RC3 fit. So I spot drilled and drilled undersize, being careful to do those operations well. Metric sidebar. One of the cool things about the ISO system is that those hole and shaft ratings are also grades of tooling. So if you know that you need a six millimeter H7 class hole, you can buy a six millimeter H7 class reamer and know that it will cut within the tolerance range that you have, as opposed to the Imperial system where you kind of have to figure out the clearance or the interference that you want and then futz with half thou and one thou oversized, undersized reamers to get the effect that you want. And of course my 250 test pin doesn't fit in there as we would expect. Now I don't want to mess up my nice test pin here, so I'm going to make another one for this press fit. So I found a piece of scrap that's exactly 2 tenths over 250. And then with that undersized reamer cutting 249, and realistically it's going to cut a couple of tenths over. So that should put us on right about a one thou interference fit, which is an FN2 at quarter inch. So if we did our job right, we can go over to the Arbor Press, get that guy nice and straight and that should press right in there. This is about the strongest interference fit that you're probably gonna to wanna to do in the hobby shop. Any tighter than this and you start to need a pretty serious press, so this is where you wanna look at a shrink fit instead, where if you wanna do, let's say, a two thou interference, you can get away with that in the hobby shop by putting the torch onto the piece with the hole in it, heating it up good and hot, and then inserting the pin and letting it cool off. One exception to this is with certain plastics. For example, if you're doing a press fit on Delrin, such as I did here on this roller. If you're interested in this project, check out my blog. I'll link to this below. I made replacement rollers for this exercise machine out of Delrin, and those bearings are pressed in there on a 5 thou interference, and that's a very aggressive interference, but the reason is that Delrin stretches a lot, and if you don't use a very aggressive interference, then it will loosen up over time and the bearings will spin. So a 5 thou interference is recommended on Delrin. Speaking of over-under reamers, they're also the secret to hitting that odd duck fit, the transition fit that I talked about earlier. These are basically a very light press fit, like a half thou interference. And these are actually really useful in the hobby shop, but they can be a little tricky to hit because of the narrow tolerance. So what you can do is buy the medium precision drill rod, and you'll find that it has a variance of plus or minus half a thou along its length and you can find a section of it that has the exact dimension that you want that's going to be say a few tenths over what you can do with your undersized reamer and that'll get you on that half thou interference for a transition fit and that's a good interference fit if for example you don't have a press because that light press you can achieve with your bench vise so that was a very rough overview of clearances and fits. This is an incredibly deep topic. You could easily do five videos about every sentence that I said in this video, but uh, I hope that it gives you a sense of the basics that a hobbyist might need to know for building the kinds of cool mechanisms that I know you want to do in your shop. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you found this useful and we'll see you next time.